Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of this summit, Lisa and Tim, for the invitation to speak. It's an honor, uh, it's an honor to be here. So um, I'm going to be discussing profenadone and nintedinib. These are my disclosures. And, uh, but before I get into those two medications, I really want to provide a more broad view of the treatment of interstitial lung disease. And so this is how I approach the care of my patients who have interstitial lung disease. You've heard today uh, the importance of an accurate multidisciplinary diagnosis. And once that's established, um, all patients should receive education and self-management strategies. They should be referred for pulmonary rehab and prescribed oxygen therapy if, um, if needed. And on top of those two foundational elements, we do disease-targeted therapy. And when disease-targeted therapy uh, doesn't work or fails, we think about lung transplantation or hospice and palliative care. And when I'm talking about disease-targeted therapy, this is what I'm talking about. It's actually um, multidimensional, multifactorial. A lot of things go into what we call disease-targeted therapy. Of course, the focus of this talk is on pharmacologic therapy, and we'll get into the details in a minute. But it also includes participation in clinical trials, if there's one available, identification and uh, management of important comorbidities, which you're going to uh, learn about this afternoon, uh, symptom management, treatment of cough, treatment of breathlessness, all of these things are incredibly important in terms of disease-targeted therapy. And then, of course, prevention, uh, vaccinations, um, seeing your doctor, getting regular checkups. Prevention is, is critical as we think about disease-targeted therapy. And really, the pharmacologic treatment of your interstitial lung disease depends on the diagnosis. And so I've listed um, a handful of common interstitial lung diseases, and you'll see they differ um, in terms of treatment. So if you have an autoimmune or connective tissue disease-related interstitial lung disease, you're going to treat the underlying connective tissue disorder, but you're also probably going to get immunosuppression. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis, if that's your disease, you want to try and find the antigen and remove it, and oftentimes patients receive immunosuppression. If you have a smoking-related interstitial lung disease, you're going to want to stop smoking. Uh, LAM or lymphangioleiomyomatosis is treated now with sirolimus. And the two medications that we're going to be discussing um, shortly really are pertinent right now to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, profenadone and nintedinib. So IPF, as many of you in this room know, is really a specific form of pulmonary fibrosis. It occurs in our aging population, and really it's limited to the lungs and has unknown etiology. And this usual interstitial pneumonia pattern is either seen on the CT scan or the lung biopsy of patients with this condition. And now we have two FDA-approved treatments for this drug. And this um, is kind of the broad overview of pharmacologic management in IPF based on our guidelines published back in 2015. And you can see we know a lot of medications that we shouldn't be using in this condition, uh, but nintedinib and profenadone are ones that have conditional uh, for-use recommendations in, in addition to antacid therapy that Dr. Ragu discussed yesterday. So now we're going to talk about each of these medications. I'm really just going to provide a broad overview of the drugs and um, the important clinical trials that led to their approval. Uh, Wendy's going to be discussing right after me um, how to manage the side effects associated with these medications, but really we're just going to talk about uh, the data to begin with. So perfenadone, also uh, called Esbriot, of course, is an antifibrotic drug that decreases fibroblast prolifer proliferation and uh, decreases a profibrotic mediator called TGF-beta. Uh, this medication requires monitoring with blood tests, and the side effects are nausea, photosensitivity, and elevated liver enzymes. So the, the first major study that really put profenadone, I think, on the map here was capacity. Um, so this was two parallel randomized control trials where they looked at profenadone compared to a sugar pill. Um, this was conducted in 110 centers in 13 different countries. And in this study, uh, both capacity studies, they enrolled 779 subjects with IPF. They did not have severe disease, so their forced vital capacity was greater than or equal to 50%, and DLCO, their diffusing capacity, was greater than or equal to 35%. And patients in this study were randomized either to profenadone or placebo, a sugar pill, for 72 weeks. 
And the primary endpoint of these uh, studies was forced vital capacity change, but they also measured, as this many clinical trials, different secondary endpoints, including progression-free survival, shortness of breath, six-minute walk distance, and overall survival. And what you can see here are the characteristics of the patients that were included in this study. So capacity one and capacity two, um, and you can see the patients who are randomized to profenadone and the patients who are randomized to placebo. And the reason why you want to look at this is you want to look to see, you know, what are the, who are the patients that they studied and were they well randomized? Were they equally distributed in terms of age, uh, gender, were the uh, disease severity similar between the two groups? And you can see across the board, actually, the randomization worked very well. They were all about the same age, same distribution of male sex, uh, lung function similar, oxygen use, and six-minute walk distance. And here are the results. So capacity one is on the graph on the left. And what you can see here is the patients who are randomized to placebo are in the green line. Uh, patients who are randomized to the lower dose of profenadone are in the blue line. And the patients who are randomized to the higher dose of profenadone were, are in the red line. And you can see in capacity one that patients who are randomized to profenadone had a slower decline in their forced vital capacity over the 72-week time period compared to placebo subjects. Now, capacity two is a little bit different in that by the end of the 72-week study, um, the line started to come together. So you can see at 72 weeks, that red line, I don't think my pointer's working. Well, the red line and the green line are coming together. So this did not meet statistical significance um, uh, as achieving their endpoint. When they pooled the data, um, it mimicked capacity one studies where patients who were taking profenadone, which were 345 subjects compared to placebo of 347, they had a slower decline in forced vital capacity. Uh, but because of these differing results, the FDA asked that um, they go back and do a third tiebreaker trial, which is ASCEND. Um, so in this study, they enrolled 555 subjects, highly selected um, with the disease of IPF, and they were randomized again to profenadone or placebo one-to-one. -one. Uh, this study was 52 weeks, not 72. The primary endpoint was still the same in terms of forced vital capacity, and again, the numerous secondary endpoints that were um, collected as part of this clinical trial. Here are your characteristics for the ASCEND study subjects. You can see similar age across the groups, similar percentage of male sex, lung function, six-minute walk distance, the shortness of breath as measured by um, a shortness of breath scale called the UCSD breathlessness score, and then the patients who had definite usual interstitial pneumonia pattern on high-resolution CT scan was is exceedingly high at 96 percent. And this was their outcome. So similar to capacity one and the pooled capacity data, patients who were randomized to profenadone and the dark blue arm had a slower decline in forced vital capacity compared to the patients who were randomized to uh, placebo. They also reported, of course, the safety and tolerability of profenadone in this patient population. Uh, there were no difference in severe adverse events uh, between the two groups. There was a higher percentage of patients who had LFT abnormalities, which is why it requires blood monitoring while patients are taking the medication. Um, there were LFT increases reported in 3% of patients taking profenadone compared to 0.7% of those on the placebo arm. And treatment discontinuation was similar between the two groups, 14.4% in those taking profenadone and 10.8% um, in those who are randomized to the placebo arm. And then you can see here the difference in adverse events that were reported for profenadone um, in the ASCEND trial. And the most common side effects associated with profenadone, of course, were nausea and rash, but also had several other um, uh, side effects reported as well. So now we'll move on to nintetinib. Nintetinib is also called OFEV, um, and it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and it works by blocking these growth factors that we think are um, responsible um, in promoting fibrosis in patients with IPF. This drug also requires monitoring with blood tests. Um, the side effects of nintetinib are diarrhea and elevated liver function, uh, liver enzymes. So this is the first major, uh, this is um, following the phase two, promising phase two results. Um, Impulsus one and Impulsus two um, were two identical randomized control trials that were done back to back. 
And in this study, they enrolled 1,066 patients um, with IPF and likely IPF, and they were randomized um, in a three to two fashion. So there were more patients randomized to nintetinib compared to placebo. And this trial was for 52 weeks, and their endpoint was the same, forced vital capacity. And they had secondary endpoints, some of which were driven by the phase two studies, uh, including acute exacerbation, um, quality of life, and death. And you can see here the characteristics of this patient population. Again, similar age profile across the two randomized control trials. A percentage of men um, a bit higher in impulses, I think, compared to uh, the profenadone studies. Forced vital capacity DLCO across the board, very similar. Um, and they measured uh, a quality of life metric called the St. George Respiratory Questionnaire, which was similar across all groups at baseline. And this is their primary endpoint, so this data is shown differently than the profenadone data where they show the slope or the change in FVC over time. This is at the end of the trial, at 52 weeks, um, they show the difference um, in FVC compared to baseline. So we'll look at impulses one here on the left. Um, the blue bar is how much uh, decline patients who are randomized to nintetinib had compared to placebo in the light gray bar, and that was statistically significant. And then Impulses 2 showed similar findings where patients who are randomized to nintetinib had a decline in FEC of 113 mLs at 52 weeks compared to 207 mLs in the placebo arm with a similar relative difference in FVC um, as the profenadone studies. The safety and tolerability of uh, nintetinib are shown here. There were, again, no difference in severe adverse events um, in those randomized to nintetinib compared to placebo. Um, again, this drug had an LFT issue where 5.1% of patients had abnormal LFTs compared to 0.7% in those randomized to placebo. Um, and what you can see here is the side effect that we know um, occurs with nintetinib. Uh, Two-thirds of patients experience diarrhea, um, but a large number also report uh, nausea as the most common side effect, as one of the more common side effects. So really, IPF treatment today um, looks like this. So you are prescribed a novel antifibrotic, either perfenidone or nintetinib. Um, the data that we have so far suggests that both therapies slow disease progression as measured by change in forced vital capacity over a one-year time period. Um, although not studied head-to-head, -head, they seem to have a similar efficacy, um, and they're, they're found to be safe compared to uh, placebo, and of course have differing tolerability profiles, which may affect which medication you are prescribed for your disease. And I think it's important to remember that these therapies are not curative. Um, they're a great first step. They slow the decline in lung function, but we are not there yet in terms of a cure. And so lots of work, and you're hearing lots of exciting science that's happening here at this meeting. Um, but there are several clinical trials that are currently active right now, and I looked on clinicaltrials.gov the other day. And um, you can see across the board from phase one to phase two to phase three clinical trials, a lot of work is being done in IPF. And whether or not any of these therapies are curative um, remains to be seen, but I think everybody should be very encouraged that people are interested in finding uh, better therapies for IPF. And that's it. And I, I left a lot of time to take questions, so I hope that's okay. Do we have mics? Okay. I think the mic is working. Yeah, go ahead. I can repeat it.
Yeah. Uh, so the question was um, speaking to the the testing of OFEV and other non-IPF interstitial lung diseases. So both profenadone and nintetinib are being studied in non-IPF interstitial lung diseases, um, including scleroderma-related interstitial lung disease, rheumatoid-related interstitial lung disease, uh, progressive interstitial lung disease. So yes, um, they are looking into the efficacy of these medications in non-IPF ILDs. Mm -hmm. Question about the NAC, the sup is this a supplement? What was the negative outcome of that in the study? Oh, so I didn't show the the Panther data. So um, the Panther was the study the IPF Net conducted in the United States, where they looked at prednisone, azathioprine, and NAC, um, and they also looked at a NAC alone arm. So this was a, a three um, arm study where there was a placebo arm a NAC only arm and a PREDASA NAC arm. And the PREDASA NAC showed that patients who were randomized to that combination of therapy had increased death and hospitalization compared to placebo, so it was actually stopped early. Um, and the data were published early, but the NAC alone arm continued. And that study showed actually no difference in FVC compared to placebo. There are some suggestions um, that it might be um, there may be genetics that might be important in terms of understanding the role of NAC, but it still remains to be seen. Question back there? Are there, is there one drug that's preferred if you're on a blood thinner? Should you stay away from either one? Um, well, I'm not sure how Lisa and others are handling that. Um, in theory, uh, nintetinib does have a bleeding risk associated with it. I haven't actually seen any bleeding risk complications, and none were reported in the clinical trials. Um, I've had some patients who've been on perfenidone and have had um, issues with their Coumadin, and I don't know, um, I think, um, and that was also not something that I was aware of before going into it, but um, I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis in the indication and what you're taking in terms of blood thinning. Um, hi, I'm wanting to refer back to your slide on the pharmacological management. Um, of IPF, mm -hmm. and it, it talks about the agents on the left side, and I'm, my question is, it talks about warfarin. So if the patient is already on warfarin for a different issue, you should, um, remain should, on it. should it be looked in, should that person possibly be tested to see if another anticoagulant would be uh, appropriate to switch to? Or do you usually just stay with the warfarin and, and, and do either the, the uh, So Ezra yes, or? I think that um, you should discuss with your doctor the um, indication for warfarin. And if there are alternatives, or, and it would be fine with, you know, from a side effect profile and a drug interaction standpoint, I think that's reasonable to consider. Uh, but the data do not suggest, it was not studied in people who had indications for warfarin. This was. Um, uh, randomizing patients to warfarin or placebo um, with no other indication but to treat their IPF. So this should not change the management of someone who has atrial fibrillation, pulmonary embolism. Uh, they should be treated uh, with anticoagulation. I think there's a question back there. How do pulmonologists choose between prescribing the perfinidone and the, and the other one? <laughs> you know, I think if you ask a different pulmonologist here at this meeting, it, you might get, I don't know, 10 different answers. But what I do is I have a discussion with the patient. I present to them actually very similarly, you know, the um, efficacy being similar. Here is the side effect profile. Here are your comorbidities. You know, what kind of drug do you think would be best for you? Because we want to ensure compliance. And if you're going to have a patient who won't take, you know, three pills three times a day, that they might not be the best candidate for perfenidone. So I think it's just a conversation with your patients. Certain comorbidities will affect how we um, uh, present the or discuss the favorability of one drug over another, but really I engage the patient. 
Have you also seen um, any patients that have less coughing with the Espriot? Say that again? Have you seen any patients that have um, symptoms like less coughing symptoms with the Espriot? The less, sorry, I'm not. Coughing. Oh, less coughing with Espriot. I have not. Up here. I can hear you. I can repeat it. You mean um, improving improve, disease? Improve. Improving disease. You know, I don't know um, the clinical, oh yeah, so she was wondering of the clinical trials that I showed you that are being presented on clinicaltrials.gov, are, they, are they targeting slowing disease progression or are they actually looking to cure the disease? I don't know the details. My guess is most of them are probably targeted towards slowing disease progression. I could be wrong about that. And you have to remember also the phases of those studies. I don't know if you, um, we're given a lecture in terms of the different phases of clinical trials, and it really is only phase three clinical trials that will lead to FDA approval. So the phase one trial is a first in human, so they're looking to see if their um, agent is safe for humans to take. It comes from preclinical animal models. Phase two studies is to look for a signal and to really empower a phase three study for efficacy. And um, I don't know, Lisa, if you know or if anybody else in the room knows if the other medications are really targeting a more curative therapy. I don't think they are. Is it? Okay, she was suggesting the desatinib trial might be. Yeah. But I think that one is, has a, a ways to go. What's the danger in taking a drug holiday and how long could you take a holiday from to avoid some of these... Uh, uh, contraindicated uh, uh, side effects? Drug holidays. Well, you know, I think um, drug holidays can be helpful if you need to kind of retitrate your medication and see if there's other things that you can institute to improve tolerability. I let Wendy speak to that. I don't know that we know any data in terms of efficacy. So if you take a three-month drug holiday, is it, are you going to have the same response as people who are taking it for a year? I don't know that we know that information. Uh, but I think that you, um, you know, if you need to take a break from the drug, you need to take a break from the drug.